Hey everybody, happy <laughs> Friday, and welcome to Glider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries. I can't see the monitor right now. And this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Christian Harloff. What's up, Shadies? It's time for <laughs> Movie Talk, and I'm Christian Harloff, and everybody here is going to have a wonderful time. Uh, what a wonderful panel we have today, and you're wonderful people. Do you know that about yourselves? Well, if you don't, I just told you, so there you go. Sinead, who else is wonderful? And please don't stare at the camera. Talk. <laughs> also here <laughs> is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm glad to be on this panel. We, we, it seems like we're uh, loopy. We're all uh, a little, yeah, uh, a little, uh, a little loopy. loopy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Crazy is the word, Dennis. Yeah. Crazy. Um, and who else is on the panel? Also joining us today is Mark Riley. Perfect. <laughs> Hi. I can't do Sinead. I can't even do it. This is great. You started off right here, uh, Christian Harloff. What a great panel we have here for you today. All right, Sin Sinead, please introduce the person that's going to save the show. All right, here she is, you guys. <laughs> it's Clark Wolf. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, hello. Oh, yes. I'm well here. played. Thank you. Know, you. you know what I realized about you, by the way, when I was watching? So many day? things. So many things. But I realized you are like a, you're a mixture of Tina Fey meets Sarah Silverman. Great. I, just, I, that's, I accept that's kind that. Of what, if you listen, that's, I, was just, I don't know why I have to say it on air, but I just wanted to tell no, you. No, I'm glad you All did. Right. I'm glad we've got video of that. We I do. put that on my reel. Oh, or this something. is movie talk. <laughs> and we're going to talk about movies. Sure. And you have a lot of stories over there that are related to movies. I do. Let's talk about one of them. All right. So, first up, Collider's <laughs> own Christina Radish was at the press day for the Lego Ninjago movie, where she was able to sit down with Nightwing director and Ninjago producer Chris McKay about his take on the solo spinoff featuring the boy wonder to superhero Dick Grayson. Though the film is still a ways off and casting hasn't begun just yet, McKay already has a plan for the movie that he hopes will set it apart from other DC movies by focusing on practical character effects rather than relying on CG, leading to a, quote, badass action movie set in the DCEU. It's going to be an effing badass action movie with a lot of heart and emotion. It's going to be a crazy fun ride. Whoever gets cast as Nightwing and any of the other actors around are going to go through an effing boot camp experience because it's going to be a lot. I'm not going to do a lot of CG. Everything he does is going to have to be real. His superpower is being really effing good as a human being at fighting and gymnastics and shit like that. So you're going to see that on screen. Christian, what do you think of a practical effects heavy action movie around Nightwing? I'm always excited when it comes to practical effects and let's not let's not be confused when people say practical effects there's still gonna be a lot of cgi there's always cgi i mean even though star wars the force awakens had a lot of practical effects it had more cgi than maybe any other movie in history it's just a matter of how you blend it and how you make it look but if this is going to be like kind of a pure action movie around like john wick type or the raid or that's that's where i i feel sometimes movies especially like with sequels sometimes is when a movie starts out kind of small and then you get too much money and you start throwing in a lot of cgi that's when you start to lose some of the magic but to go into nightwing here give me a pure action movie i still don't necessarily know where it ties in to dceu or if it does it all or how dick grayson fits in or how he doesn't i don't want to worry about any of that right right now what i want to worry about is whether or not i like what he is saying I do. I think it's very interesting to paint this as a full-on action film. Just he wants to make it a badass action flick. That's something right now. Yes, there are action in these superhero movies, but we haven't got whether you look at and not just DCU, Marvel also. If you look at like I, I always bring up the reference of Captain uh, America: Civil War. That was a spy thriller. What movie of the comic movies has just been like kind of like a straight up old school? 80s action film or 90s action film. There hasn't really been one, so I'm encouraged by this. Yeah, um, you know, when I heard these comments, I actually thought of Marvel's Daredevil on Netflix. Yeah. Ooh, that yeah. feels very true to life. It feels heartfelt. It feels emotional, but it also feels like true action, like and and real boot camp, hand to hand physical yep. combat. Um, and so I think if he and he probably isn't allowed to say just like they're doing on Daredevil, yeah. but but I think if he takes a page out of that book, that would be interesting. The other part of it is too that you know, Batman and the people in the Batman universe are, for the most part, you know, don't have traditional superpowers. Right. And so I think it makes, it's really smart, practical sense to be thinking about practical, you know, physicality when you're talking about Batman and his uh, extended universe. Dennis? Yeah, I think with the practical effects, it's, it's about using it in the right way, like you said, Christian. It's, it's one of those things like uh, Mad Max Fury Road was praised for a lot of practical effects. And it had a lot, but it also had a lot of CG, but it knew where to use it. It's better used in the backgrounds, in the locations, where, where 
anything kind of tangible for the audience to see is better off because we've seen fight sequences before where you see heavy CG in it and then suddenly it just starts to look like a cartoon or right. a video game and you don't see that weight even even if you're not looking at it immediately thinking CG I think subconsciously you know and so if they go the, the physical practical effects route then I think it's going to hold a lot more more uh, weight with to it Riley I, I love these comments I, I would love to see just a straight up action movie like give me like John Wick with uh, with Dick Grayson Nightwing and what, what he's saying here he even he even says something like he gets this character because it, the other quote that's in this great interview that you can go to dot-com collider.com and see is that we've never had a, a character that you actually grow up with mm -hmm. he was Robin and everybody went I don't want to be Robin he's a dork I want to be Batman and then he grows up before our eyes he becomes Nightwing and that's an arc that's something that's interesting that you can play with in story and it just seems like McKay I love the, uh, the Lego Batman movie I think he has a handle on this character in a way that we haven't seen in the DCEU so it makes me very excited for this movie all right What's next? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> At the press day for the Lego Ninjago movie, Collider.com also spoke to producers Dan Lin and Chris McKay about the sequel to the Lego movie, where it was revealed that both Phil Lord and Chris Miller are back and rewriting the script. Lin also revealed that the new movie will deal with gender issues in regards to how boys play with Legos versus how girls play, with the movie picking up where the first movie left off, in which the Duplo, or Legos for infants, are attacking Bricksburg. <laughs> Producer Chris McKay described it like this. The Duplo represents Finn's sister, Finn being the little boy from the live action. The Duplo is her. The man upstairs said, you've got to play with your sister, that's the thing, you've got to promise me. I'll let you play with my world, but now you've but now you've got to let your sister come in and play with your world. Now she's coming in, and that's the major thing that the movie is about. What's different and similar about gender when a boy plays versus how a girl plays? What kind of stories are there? Dennis, what are your thoughts on Lord and Miller back rewriting the Lego movie sequel? Well, I'm glad that they're coming back to write this. I mean, I wish they, they came back to direct it as well, because I love the first Lego movie so much. In this one, I, I like the take that they're going with, because it ends up being a kind of a discussion of, what is nature, what is nurture, right? Because we know you can't th say that, okay, little girls are going to act or behave or play with toys the same way that guys are. Even if you put the same toys, you raise them the same, there's just something inherent. In I'm sorry, guys, little little boys, they want to blow up things. They want to smash things. They, they want to fight. There's just a certain thing that they gravitate towards. And and it doesn't mean that girls can't do that as well, but it's just inherent in them. I was going to say, tell my daughter yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's going to be interesting how they play with it. And they also have to walk a fine line. You don't want to get too stereotypical as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing is I hear this, and I just I know my daughter. My daughter is actually plays, like, probably because it's me, and I yeah. play with her all the time. I've taught her. But she plays like a boy. She yeah. really does. But I think that it's very interesting to go back and forth because this explanation is fascinating that's the way you have to take it to the next one because i also think it's a very smart way creatively to get everyone interested because the first lego movie not a lot of people were like oh this is going to be real fun this is going to be a movie that everyone can watch it was like what the hell is this for a lot of people did and then they saw it and it was great i just watched it recently again with my daughter she loved it um and i think that by now with a sequel people who are excited to have the writers the directors now coming back as the writers and then you had this new element because they did i thought that was brilliant at the very end where they had it was the sister who was kind of getting involved and, and changing up this this kid finally is is fighting the whole way to, for his dad to accept and let it, let him play in this in this playhouse and he does because like, now you got to play with your sister and that was going to be this this it's kind of got a toy story thing to it also so um i like the comments i think that's the way you have to go with it glad they're coming back makes sense that they're coming back now with all the han solo stuff behind them um and i bet you that if the han solo stuff hadn't happened they would have directed this but um yeah i'm on board with this yeah, it sounds good to me who knew you could do gender issues in a lego movie <laughs> i mean it's fascinating to me and and again chris mckay is a uh the director of nightwing is a producer on this and he's talking with dan lynn and and and, and all this that it's great to come from the the point of view of of uh, a male and a female and i have a lot i personally have a connection to this because i played toys with my sister, Star Wars. She would come in as Princess Leia. I'd be there with Luke and we would just play and she would want to always get in there and just, and my sister is a very strong woman nowadays and she's coming in hot, wanting to get in there and play with me and I'd be like, no, no, no. I love the idea of exploring this in a movie and especially in a Lego movie. Can't wait.
Clark. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm glad you brought up Star Wars because I think actually, believe it or not, this is a very topical issue. We saw the reaction of them not making a lot of Ray toys right. when The Force yeah. Awakens came out. We saw the black of Black Widow being in the Avengers play sets and like them giving Captain America Black Widow's motorcycle. So I think this is something where you can have a lot of fun. Parents are gonna laugh, kids are gonna have a good time, and you, there, there's so much opportunity for satire and uh, and a timely conversation. Um, and you guys know how I feel about Lord and Miller. I love them. I think they've got a perfect track record. And um, the fact that they're back on board anything is is great news to me. All right. Um, are we time for buy and sell? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we are. It's time yeah. for buy or sell, Sinead. So we are going to, Sinead's going to read a couple more uh, movie topics. And we're just going to buy or sell them. What do you got? A new Red Bend trailer has landed online for The Shape of Water, the highly anticipated new movie from Guillermo del Toro. The movie took the top prize at this past year's Venice Film Festival. Whoops. Sorry, and is now being buzzed about as a serious Oscar contender. The movie opens in theaters this December 8th, and to read up on all its Oscar chances as well as the full review, head on over to Collider.com, where both articles are currently up. Clark. Buy or sell the new Red Band trailer for The Shape of Water. Well, I'm sitting next to Giggles McGee over here. <laughs> <laughs> All of you, don't, don't point each other fingers at each other. I'm just uh, laughing at him. You no, know, it's very silly. We've got we've got the A team on today, that's for sure. <laughs> Obviously. Um, anyway, the coffee team. Uh, yeah, I buy this. Of course. Are you shocked? No. Um, th look, Guillermo, I I'm so happy that, so you guys know I love um, Crimson Peak. Uh, I know it was not for everybody, but I do think that knowing everything that we know about that movie, that Guillermo had a vision for that movie that was a bit uh, watered down by working with a big studio. Um, and so I am so glad that this very human and very personal romantic story it just so happens to feature a fish man, was his <laughs> next project. Because you can tell that when Guillermo pours his whole heart into something and is given total control over what it is that he's doing, you get things like a Pan's Labyrinth. And it sounds to me, you know, people are just raving about this. And as far as the Red Band trailer goes, this is such a quirky, weird trailer, and I love it. Mm. I, I love that, that this just, I, I haven't seen the film yet, but it seems to show you exactly the type of movie you're going to get. And if you watch this trailer and you go, I don't get it, then it's probably not for you. But for right. those of us who are excited by this type of trailer, uh, it, it's 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 such a such a wonderful wonderful treat. So I buy it big time. Yeah, I'm gonna buy it. I'm not going to buy it as, as big as Clark did, um, but I'm definitely curious about it because Pan's Labyrinth, I still think, is Del Toro's best work. I think that that's the kind of movie yeah. I want to see him do. It looks, this looks like a mixture of that meets Hellboy um, from the, as far as visuals go, not necessarily story. But I, and, and I love the cast. I, I, I did not like Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crimson Tide I liked a lot. Yeah, Crimson, yeah, yeah. Tide. Crimson Tide movie. is a good movie. i got to revisit it. Yeah. Uh, but Crimson Peak I did not like, and I was excited for that one. I always get excited for Del Toro's movies. Mm -hmm. So he's doing something right there because he's a brilliant filmmaker. This trailer I liked, and I know that I was watching it Riley, and Riley had already seen it, and he was all amped up about it, and he's like, let me see it. And maybe kind of oversold it with with your Maybe. enthusiasm for me anyway yeah. and i i left going yeah that sounds that seems like it's another del toro movie that i'm gonna go into excited and hope he nails it but i'm not going in overly excited yet but i, I want to see another trailer yeah how about you yeah i it's so a yeah, buy huge it huge buy yeah, i'm with you clark um we, we we like a lot of the same things obviously and this this is a movie that is is made for me i i'm a big fan of these movies of like whether you have Hiccup and Toothless and How to Train Your Dragon or Elliot and E.T. or now this where these relationships romantic or otherwise with a creature set at the backdrop of this when I we, we covered this mm -hmm. on Nightmares we first heard this log line I was like huh yeah it was when Doug Jones like Doug was Jones. in studio yeah. and told us what this movie was about we were like you, Whoa! You're kind of—it's it, hard to wrap your head around. Then you see it in action, at least in a, in a small, but a, a trailer. Then you start to read these reaction, and yeah, at, on Collider.com, you have what it could qualify. I mean, Brian Forma, who we work with here in the office, did the review from the Venice Film Festival, where it won the top prize. That's great. It won the top prize. He's raving about it, and that to me gets me so excited. Then you read what it could win. 
best picture, best uh, director, wow. best actress, all these things down the line. There's something special there. And from coming from Guillermo del Toro, Pan's Labyrinth, which I agree with, is his best work. I, this is a huge buy. This might be my favorite movie of the year. Haven't seen it. Could be my favorite movie it's of the year. It's got the potential. Potential. Dennis, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I'm probably a little more enthusiastic than you, Christian. Maybe not as high on it as, as Clark and Riley. But I also, I, I, didn't, I actually liked Crimson Peak. Uh, I, I didn't love it, but I, I did enjoy it and I appreciated it for what it was. I think they marketed it wrong. They marketed it into like a straight horror film. Yeah. Um, this one, the only question I had is, I don't really get why they had to do a red band trailer for this. There was like one, yeah. one yeah. F bomb, yeah. a little bit of blood here and there, but I, I don't know. I, I felt like they could have just made a normal trailer with almost everything they had in there. I mean, they, they had the, the sign language thing was a little funny with the. the she never F, finished. F, though. Yeah, she right, never right, right. finished. Um, and then uh, Del Toro, he co wrote this with Vanessa Taylor, who also wrote some Game of Thrones episode. Okay. Mm -hmm, yeah. Which uh, is promising. So yeah. uh, I, I think this this could be, uh, and then all you guys are talking about all the rave reviews from from Tiff. Yeah, I think the reason that we probably got a red band trailer is for. I think it's probably the marketing team um, trying to inform the audience that this is an R-rated movie. Mm -hmm. And knowing Guillermo, when he goes R-rated, he can tell a beautiful, fantastic love story, but still have vulgarity and violence right. and all of those things. So you're right. Like it didn't. I didn't really understand what was so red band about it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's. I think it's trying to subliminally plant, like, hey, for your for your holiday mm -hmm. Oscar viewing season, sure. this is going to be a hard. Are yeah. and it's weird Guillermo del Toro, so like, don't get it twisted. Yeah. yeah, all right, okay, what's next? Sony Pictures has released the first trailer for All the Money in the World, the second film from Ridley Scott in 2017 after this summer's Alien Covenant. The movie tells his true life story of the kidnapping of John Paul Getty III and his mother's desperate attempt to convince his wealthy grandfather to pay the ransom. The movie stars Michelle Williams, Mark Wahlberg, and Kevin Spacey and opens in theaters on December 8th later this year. Riley, do you buy or sell the first trailer for All the Money in the World? This is another big buy for me. Um, as much of a horror fan, Guillermo del Toro fan, all these things, I'm also a huge fan of true crime. It's a true story that was fascinating when I've read up on it over the years. And this just looks like it, it's hitting a lot of right notes for me as far as acting, just kind of mystery, kind of drama. And Michelle Williams looks like she's kind of knocking it out of the park again. Once again. I mean, just just from her picking up the phone and saying, I don't have money. There was something about her that I just went, huh. And then you have that reveal. My favorite part in this trailer is the reveal of Kevin Spacey <laughs> in makeup that looks fantastic. But him is, is Getty, the older Getty. I know this story very well. And he is not a likable character, not a likable man. Likes his money, doesn't care about his family necessarily. But that's what I think the movie is going to explore. And it looks fascinating. And then you have Mark Wahlberg come in who's taking kind of second billing behind Michelle Williams. That's fascinating to me too. And when Ridley Scott does a movie well and knocks it out of the park like The Martian, this, this is something to look forward to. So it's a big buy. Uh, it's a huge buy for me. I think that um, it, it, this movie is exactly what you said. I actually think Mark Wahlberg should get a lot of credit here because He's not the typical movie star that always needs to be front and center for everything. Yeah. Whether it's he certainly has those movies that he does, but like whether it's Departed and and movies like that. that were, but he's also a really great producer. Now I don't think he has anything to do with producing this film, but he also knows when to pull back and just because he's barely even in this thing, you know. But it's like you mentioned though, Michelle Williams. I think some of her best work was Manchester by the yeah. Sea. No, There's, yeah. Regardless of what you think about the movie, like she is in a particular scene when they meet up with each other and oh, she yeah. just broke my okay. heart with certain yeah. things that she, the way that she delivers things, her, how subtle she is. So this is a great role for her. But yeah, it's Ke Kevin Spacey is the, is the talk right now. Kevin Spacey is mm -hmm. Getty at the very end. He's unrecognizable. He doesn't look like he's in, like when, when, I think it was Army Hammer was in J. Edgar. He looked oh, like yeah. the Six Flags guy when he was <laughs> so stupid. Like it's hard when people dress up as old. When you're older, it look you look silly. Don't look silly here. It mm -hmm. looks legit, and it looks like Kevin Spacey is just immersed in that <laughs> role. So this is something I'm uh, I'm very curious about, and I think it could be an Oscar buzz type movie. Uh, I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna be a little more hesitant than you. I did enjoy The Martian and and even Alien uh, Covenant. I enjoyed as well. But I'm still, you know, there's still the the Ridley Scott that did Exodus, Gods and Kings. That sure. still, so he still, I still haven't 
he hasn't completely won me back yet. So anything like this, I'm, I'm still a little wary of. But from the trailer, it looked good. Yeah, Michelle Williams, Manchester by the Sea, which, which I actually really liked. And she had a great performance. And she was not, uh, had, she didn't even have that big of a role in that film. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Kevin Spacey. I think that's all everyone's going to be talking about, though, is Kevin Spacey. Because he, if you didn't tell me, just like the uh, Gary Oldman doing a Winston Churchill, mm-hmm. like right. if, you didn't, if, you, if you didn't tell me it was him, I, I, I had no idea. Clark? Yeah, it's a big buy for me. I loved this trailer. I just thought it was a very well put together trailer. I thought that it conveyed the. So, unlike uh, Riley, I had never heard this story before. Mm. And so I, I had no idea about any of this. And so I thought that it conveyed not only the story very well and also conveyed that this was going to be a very well acted film, but I also thought it put forward a lot of suspense. I mean, I really felt the tension and the drama that they're trying to get out of this. Um, And the will he, won't he come through for the family and what is she going to do? So I was, I I thought this was incredible. I'm very excited for this movie. All right. What's next? 20th Century Fox has released the first trailer for Red Sparrow, the new movie that stars Jennifer Lawrence, directed by her Hunger Games director, Francis Lawrence. The movie focuses on a young Russian woman, Dominika, played by Lawrence, who joins the Sparrow program, a secret service that trains her into becoming a powerful weapon. The movie also stars Joel Edgerton, Charlotte Rampling, Mary Louise Parker, and Jeremy Irons, and is set to hit theaters on March 2nd next year, 2018. Christian, do you buy or sell the first trailer for Red Sparrow? I'm going to buy the first trailer for the origin story of Black Widow. Um, <laughs> I, but I am going to buy it because it, 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 to me, seems like the movie I was hoping to get in the Charlize Theron movie. What was that Atomic movie? Blonde. Yeah, I didn't like that movie at all. I didn't like it at all. I, it was pitched one way and, and it was delivered on something completely different. This movie looks like it actually could be that type of film. And I buy Jennifer Lawrence as as this character, and I buy Jennifer Lawrence as someone who can kick ass. I mean, regardless if you think she phoned it in in the last, um, in, I was about to say in the last Mystic Pizza movie, but she Mystic. definitely wasn't in that. She's <laughs> only Mystic been one Pizza. of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Her and Julia Roberts. Right, but <clears> in the last Mystique uh, performance, I, I, she's great at the physical roles. Hunger Games, she was great in, in those roles, and playing off of that, working once again uh, with Marshall. Because didn't didn't she work with Marshall before? She did. Because you know Gary Ross did the first one, and then you mean Francis Lawrence. Lawrence. Francis Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. My head's all messed up, guys. I'm yeah. not gonna Hunger just, Games. Look, one they of those. Th- no, let me let me take a time out here. Uh, every once in a while, you get those shows to where your head says you ain't working today. That's the day. <laughs> and so you'll see this on bloopers, and I'm cool with that. Are you cool with it? If not. <laughs> I don't care. We'll so, bring you home, Christian. Thank don't you. Worry Francis about Marshall is doing this thing. Francis Marshall is directing this, and and Louis La- Joey Lawrence stars. Penny uh, Marshall is yeah. directing this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Penny uh, Marshall. Gary Joey Marshall. Lawrence. <laughs> Joey Francis. Lawrence. Yeah. Joey Lawrence, <laughs> unrecognizable <laughs> as Getty. Whoa! Wait a minute. This is the wrong. What? We're off there the rails. Yeah, there um, we are. But Francis Lawrence <laughs> is just doing the movie, and they've worked together before. They worked well together, and I think that he's going to be able to direct her. I'm sure that that's why they decided to do this together but i understand that there's some skepticism behind it but what do you think then yeah I mean, i'm gonna buy it there is skepticism whether or not she's gonna you know put in the full effort like you mentioned with mystique and x-men like right. i kind of try to yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean thank you for helping i'm me actually i'm actually a, f- a fan of hers i think she she phoned that thing in she right. like i don't know phoned it from another country um <laughs> but but in this one the question is working with francis lawrence Reteaming with him is that going to maybe get her? I mean, I, I just saw her mother, and she obviously committed to that yeah, yeah. role. Is she going to commit to something like this, which is kind of maybe maybe she's happy not to wear all that blue makeup or whatnot, and right. and she's going to work on the physicality stuff. So visually, it looks fantastic. All the shots of her walking and and whatnot, and it, yes, it does look like a Black Widow origin story. Clark. Um, this one's a sell for me. Mm. I, uh, you know, kind of for all of the reasons that we've sort of touched on, you know, the idea that it looks okay is this atomic blonde, but with Jennifer Lawrence. Right. Um, you know, I'm a little burned out on Jennifer Lawrence right now. Um, and uh, so this does not look interesting. Although I will say I like Francis Lawrence a lot. Um, so, like, not maybe, Joey Lawrence. Not Joey Lawrence <laughs> or Joey Tribbiani. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I so, so, that would probably be the thing that would compel me to get into the theater. But as of now, I'm selling Jennifer Lawrence and her wigs. Uh, how about you? What's yeah, your name? Yeah, my name's Mark. Nice. Um, 
Uh, yeah, it's a sell for me too. Unfortunately, uh, just because it didn't do anything for me. The trailer, it was it was real short. Um, I didn't get a. I I felt like it was like, look, you can do a Black Widow movie. Look at that. Maybe you wanted to look at that because Kevin Feige says, oh yeah, we've had plans. Well, here it is. Too late. There, too late. There, there's the movie. Right. I'd like to see. I, I'm not necessarily burnt out on Jennifer Lawrence. I've just been not really interested in her performances lately. I still need to see Mother. I still do need to see Mother. But yeah, I'm with you, Dennis. Like, Apocalypse, she phoned it in from France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, don't I know didn't where love that movie, Mother, but I thought she was back to form mm -hmm. in that she film. Back I to think form. that's also with directing. And I think that she did, I don't think she was as interested in no. doing the X Men movies anymore. I think it was just a paycheck for her. But I think that this is a movie that she could have a lot of fun with. So, but I understand. I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's. it looks like it's been done. And if you like Atomic Blonde, um, then you can say, well, I've seen that already. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that movie, so I want to see it done well. So, but 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 there's it's got a positive review. A lot of people that saw it dug it. So you might not want to see that done over again. But nonetheless, it's happening. So deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. So we have other things going on in the world of Collider, and one of those is that Heroes and TV Talk. If you didn't know, daily stuff. All the big fall shows are coming back, and TV Talk covers all of them. If you're a TV fan. Everybody is. TV's getting as big as movies with streaming and everything else. Why don't you go and check out TV Talk? Because um, what's happening? Why are you doing something else? Yeah. <laughs> Why am I looking at that one? Why am I looking at that one? See? Look, like I told you. That's the right one. Like I told you. Don't critique anything happening. There are three chipmunks singing in my head right now. Shingy. One of whose names is Frank. One of his name is Daryl, and the other one won't tell me his name. It's a strange conversation going on in there, and I'm trying to live in the real world. You think you know what's going on? You don't. And you think I'm drunk? I'm not. Totally sober. And Jennifer Lawrence is still working with Joey Lawrence. All right, now we're moving on in and moving on up as we get to the today's plugs, which I just said. You watching TV? If you're not watching TV, you should be, because every day we have TV talk. Go on over to TV Talk, where it's daily now. Josh McCook is over there slinging stuff. <laughs> and you sound up. like drunk uncle at Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my drunk man. uncle, he just showed they up. They don't talk about bachelor pad, and he should. Because his people trying to fall in love. And I'm going up against Dan Merle for the oh title. Oh, my God. What yes. a segue. What's next? <laughs> you're not gonna, you're not gonna hover on that. You're no. not gonna plug your match. Oh, it doesn't matter at this point. People don't. At, at this point, they want me to lose. Yeah. All right. Well, so. hopefully, hopefully, you don't show up like that. Uh, yes, yeah, right. right. no you gotta get those chipmunks out of your head and get your get head in the don't game. Don't bring them back, man. Oh. All right, let's talk about not ball bag. Let's talk about mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about mailbag because mailbag is something that works. You got <laughs> oh my god. Everyone's drunk, you guys. And for once, oh. it's not me. Oh. <laughs> Sinead, read something. Okay. Right. <laughs> what do we got? Okay. Chris writes, Hey, Glider Group. Seems like a lot of people are saying that J.J. Abrams never finishes a story and only seems to set things up. Uh, With that go. idea in mind, do you think Abrams should have directed the untitled Han Solo movie instead, since it is setting up Han Solo as a character, and then have Ron Howard direct episode 9 since he can try something new and Kathleen Kennedy is on good terms with him? Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so Surprisingly, I'm going to say no to this uh, because I think that the difference here, and I've been vocal with the J.J. Abrams thing, and we talked about it on Jedi Council yesterday too, so I don't need to go into this in depth, but J.J. Abrams as opposed to Ron Howard, J.J. Abrams set up the characters that we're going to get invested in from 7, 8, and 9. So if it's not Ryan Johnson and it happens to be J.J. Abrams, I'm cool with it. My, my, my biggest concern is the fact that he hasn't executed very well in the past, but I also think he doesn't have... He doesn't have the kind of weight that was on his shoulders going into The Force Awakens. He doesn't have, when he went in, and I said this on Jedi Council, when he went into Force Awakens, there was no one going, oh man, JJ's just gonna rehash and JJ's gonna do this. It was JJ get to just go in and do what he wanted to do. He has to be aware that people are worried that it's gonna be a rehash of Jedi. and It's not gonna be. Ron Howard came in to do a certain job for Han Solo and rework it. Um, I don't think Ron Howard would have been the guy for episode nine. I think that if it's a choice between those two, J.J. Uh, Abrams over Ron Howard for this movie. Oh, yeah, I agree. I, I agree 100%. And, and since I haven't had a chance to really talk on it, just real quick, I wanted to say, Please. like, I had said on Twitter when they announced J.J., uh, you know, directing, that it was it was a safe choice. And, um, yeah. and 
And it was, for me, the thing that I've sort of been complaining about, not complaining, but just like expressing kind of a little bit of frustration, the idea of like, I feel like uh, the Lucasfilm is really playing it super safe and like, and turning the franchise in when I think they should be bringing in new blood to uh, to put the franchise, bring the franchise out. And um, and and I love J.J. Abrams and I, I love The Force Awakens. It wasn't a criticism on that. It was, they set up the precedent of hiring three different directors, right? They put the idea in my head that they were going to do that. So to, you know, part ways with Trevorrow, fine. I'm not a huge fan of his anyway. But instead of going out, instead of following JJ's advice and hiring Ava DuVernay or someone else who was exciting and could kind of really close the franchise with new ideas, um, they they went back to the safe bet, the one they know will deliver uh, what they want. Right. And that was the frustration to me. Mm. Um, but anyway, and no, I don't think Ron Howard should have directed this one. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, yeah, we talked about it on Jedi Council yesterday, and, and unfortunately, I think what happened at Lucasfilm is they painted themselves into a corner with, they try, I, you know, they, for what it's worth, they did try, and it just didn't happen with Lord and Miller, and then obviously Colin Trevorrow, and even some of the Trank. things, you Trank, a Trank, obviously, and then even if you believe uh, all the Rogue One stuff that Tony Gilroy right. came in and, and directed that movie, but... And unfortunately, because they painted himself in the corner, they needed to somebody to come in and help him out. And that's why we have J.J. Abrams. It is safe. It's absolutely safe. I personally believe that he can do it. I said yesterday, Ryan Johnson is kind of now handing off to him, whereas he was handing it off to Ryan Johnson before. So I think he's going to have to play in the world that Ryan Johnson has expanded upon. With Ron Howard, he's, I always said, he's like the father that is cooking at your barbecue. He's safe. He's like, hey, how do you want your burger? How do you want your Han Solo movie? That's what he's doing. I, I don't want him for nine. I think it's, it's right what they're doing, at least in this time, without any options. I, too, was hoping for a very spectacular pick, like an Ava DuVernay. I wanted Ryan Johnson to maybe finish it out, but I would have been happy uh, either way. But, you know, now let's see what J.J. does with it. Dennis. Yeah, I think I'd still take J.J. over Ron Howard. I mean, I, I mentioned I didn't like the fact that we're going back to J.J. I, I'd rather him have done episodes 7 and 8 and then someone else do 9. Uh, but the fact is, he is familiar with, with the cast and the crew. Right. I mean, th there's comfortability factor with that. And so he, they, they want to make sure, like you said, it, they, it, they, they made the safe bet. They want him to come in and just kind of go with it, as opposed to... If Ron Howard came into it, he'd have to be learning all this new stuff. He, you know, who knows? Did he did he watch Force Awakens? Yeah. Who knows? Right. You know, like he maybe you know he probably has some like uh, lore and canon stuff to read. If he's not had as it. attached. Where, yeah, right. where, where Han Solo is a little separate. He could do kind of what he wants with that. It, it's it's Han Solo in the beginning. They have the story where this one is attached to all all this different stuff that's going on. And I, I just feel like. Yeah, I think JJ JJ is a better fit. Yeah, you know, you, hearing you say that also, it's like there really were for this particular movie because I don't disagree with you when this when this franchise needs some new blood down the line and some new and and, and new blood can come with um you know like the director of of, of Obi Wan and, and like yeah you know, there's there's, there's <clears throat> new blood to, like you can still be experienced and be new blood but I think Episode Nine really only had three or four choices for something that you just said as far as because they needed to get it out. I mean, I knew it was never going to be in that May date. It was going to be December. But they needed to make sure it was either going to be Trevorrow. It either had to be Trevorrow, J.J., Ryan Johnson, or Dave Filoni, right? Mm -hmm. Dave Filoni was never going to happen because the reason why I bring all these people up and why it had to be those, because of the, what you just said, it's the amount of connection that is into this franchise at this point of being thrown into production in January to learn you know, if someone else, if it was happening in a year from now, then you hire someone on, someone, you know, younger blood to really do all the research. But to fire someone into production in January, it's got to be someone that's already tied into the franchise one way or another or understands it at least. I, or maybe there's a director out there that's so like been waiting to direct it yeah. that you oh, oh you know by the way Matthew Vaughn's been studying up yeah. and watching he knows he knows he reads out. all the books he's ready to go and there's certainly situations that could happen there but I just believe that that's the scenario so the more and more I think about it even though I still I agree with you I think that it's a safe choice and I think that there it's it's just it's easy but I think that right now it's really their their hands were kind of tied after Ryan Johnson said no I'm I'm too tired. The only question I have is because the, the reports are that Ryan Johnson 
turned it down mm. because he wanted a break because he's he just finished yeah, eight. He worked just for two and a half yeah, years on this. But movie. now they delayed it. I mean, wouldn't that give a little more break? No, or no, no, because no. It, yeah. it it would because they delayed it as far as how much time because instead of having a year and a half to go from production into mm -hmm. post now he's got two years but he'd still be work jj's still gonna be working okay. all that time like so you're still you're going okay. in january yeah he's writing he's gotta this write now. you gotta finish yeah. your script by yeah january. with chris terrio right. he's gonna write it now then he's gonna go previs oh that's right pre yeah, they're, they're, development. they're scrapping the original script that that trevorrow right. it, wrote in i think there's right. a there's a They've lot been of working on it by the way yeah. probably the last like month we agree on yeah. that right oh, yeah um all right so let's move on now so we didn't because this has just been a completely insane show in general um instead of doing Twitter, I posted in Facebook and I tagged Sinead in there and I asked you guys to basically uh, what we normally do for Twitter is ask some new questions and Sinead, you picked out a bunch, right? Yeah, there's so many. All right, well, what do we got? Let's go for it. All right, so Gail McGowan says, are there any movies you are embarrassed to admit that you've never seen? Oh, so many. Yeah, I got yes. one. And I, can you do it? But I don't want you to be on me when I announce it. Can you put the close up on Dennis's face? Uh, I've never seen Lawrence of Arabia. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I just killed Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's one I do want to see because apparently I'm in Lawrence of Arabia and I'll bring up the picture. You ever seen that picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll show it to you and I'll make everyone laugh. But seriously, Google Christian Harloff in Lawrence of Arabia. It'll come up. Uh, Riley, how about you? Oh, I don't know. I can't. I'm trying to think. Uh, trying I'm to really Robin trying to think. It's I, hard to pick just one. Like, yeah. I feel yeah. like there's so many amazing classic movies that I have not seen. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the first thing that jumped in my head was um, the fact that I hadn't seen A Wonderful Life for as long as I hadn't mm. seen it, which I finally saw it a couple years ago. So I'm gonna throw Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Oh, oh just yeah. kind of stand there, haven't seen it. Need to see it, because it's a classic. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of holes in my Western uh, repertoire, mm. like uh, all the you know spaghetti Westerns yeah. and, and things like that. I definitely haven't seen it. And then uh, a lot of, you know, I've got a lot of holes in my Scorsese game uh -oh. as well. Like what, Rage really? Ball? Uh, I've seen Raging okay, Bull okay. and um, and a lot of the ones from the '90s and more recent films. So but like the yeah, oh, mean yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Like Mean Streets right. is one, and some of those in the in the in the middle there. Kings, uh, Kings you of you know what? Comedy, I've definitely okay. seen because you know I love Lions. I have not. I have not seen Kings of Comedy, and and King, I'm embarrassed King to King, King of Comedy. Of comedy. See, see yeah. I haven't seen it. Didn't even see the title. Yeah. <laughs> the title just missed me. I missed the poster. Okay. All right. What's next? Wait, do you know tennis? Uh, I'm taking a look at the list of classic. I mean, the one that stands out to me is uh, 12 Angry Men. I oh, haven't yeah. seen yeah. yet. Uh, that's a good uh, one. There's like ones that I've seen more recently, but the, it took me a long time, like All About Eve, uh, mm -hmm. The Apartment. Like oh, those, are, the, oh. those are all ones that I watched recently in the last, like let's say, five mm -hmm. years where I purposely like, OK, I need to, to watch these. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, what's next? Jeff says, do you think The Rock is limited to his acting roles because of his huge tattoos? Does having large visible tattoos affect an actor's chances of getting Oscar caliber roles? Great wow. question. That's a good, good question, question Didn't, it, doesn't, do it doesn't affect Angelina Jolie. I mean, she's covered. I'm being serious. Like, mm -hmm. she's really covered in tattoos, and she's a very respected director and actress. They, they hire incredible makeup artists to come in and apply uh, makeup and coverings and things like that. Yeah. So I don't think The Rock is hindered for an Oscar because he's covered in tattoos. No, I don't think so either because, I mean, even a movie I saw today, they, they, with all the, what they can do with computers too, if they wanted to, they could just they take it CG out. They can CG out a you mustache just, for goodness sake. You yeah. just take I mean, it out. I mean, yeah. if it's really, if, if it's really that big of a deal, and even, even in smaller movies, it's like, you know, you could, you could remove that type of stuff if that, if that was the case. So no, I don't think it's tattoos that's keeping the rock from Oscars. Can you imagine the, the studio executive going, Sorry, The Rock, uh, too many tattoos. <laughs> Say that to his face. See yeah, what happens. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they, yeah, they could do whatever they I want. I think it's less about that tattoos and just more his physical size. That, yeah. That's just people are going to see that and they're immediately going to not think that he's a good actor. He's always going to have the stigma of being yeah. a wrestler, too. Yeah. I mean, he always will, and that's not fair. It's not mm -hmm. fair at all because, I, th I mean, he's improved dramatically oh, yeah. from when he started. Like, I, And I think that movies like Faster and Snitch prove what kind of actor he can be. Pain and Gain, he's great. He's in great in that movie. I mean, he, he's, he's a guy that, and he, he, it just shows you what his work ethic was like when he was in wrestling and in football and everything too. He just, he doesn't stop. He, he keeps trying to get better and get better. And I think Channing Tatum is another person that's <laughs> like that as well. So I, I would not be surprised in like five, 10 years from now if like it's one of those conversations like, 
Dwayne Johnson is not is going to be nominated for some for his role because he's he's learning. My little brother is fifteen, and I don't think that he thinks of The Rock as a wrestler first. Sure. Right. Yeah. I've, I have noticed the way that we've talked about it before because we and I forgot how the conversation came up, but he was like, well, um, it was along the lines of like The Rock is in so many movies that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, like, he has been famous for a really long time. And he was like, well, what are you talking about? And I was like, when he was wrestling, he was like, oh, yeah. Like, I don't even think that it's like for a younger audience Mm -hmm. who are just now getting into more adult movies. I don't think that they view him that way. So that's kind of cool. That's cool. for. I mean, for that, all he needs, though, is he needs that younger generation to get on the committee from the SAG. I mean, that's uh, for uh, for the Academy Academy. Awards. But, yeah, you're right. It's it's funny. You don't think about that. Um, All right. Let's do two more. Okay, Manuel says, do you think the success of It will catapult a new crop of horror remakes from studios? Okay. Hell yeah, first go Clark, of, go First Clark. of all, It is not a remake. Preach it. You're not remaking Preach. a TV movie that was on network television in the 90s. You are making a feature film adaptation of a novel. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> nerd. Yeah. Uh, okay, but that my frustration is not with you. It was Miguel. Miguel, my frustration is not with you. Uh, But the answer is, unfortunately, I do think that studios are going to learn the wrong lessons from it. I think they are going to say we need more uh, Stephen King adaptations, and I think they are going to say we need more scary clowns. When really, I think if you look at why it is successful, yes, people are hungry for this R-rated feature film adaptation of one of the most notorious and famous novels of all times at time. And yes, they're ready for a super scary clown. But when you watch the movie, it is it is extra scary, not only because Muschietti directed the hell out of it, but because you care about those characters. You know, if you're invested in, and so that's what I hope the studios learn. I hope they learn that that audiences will be more invested and more passionate about your horror movie if they care about the characters. The same way we care about Ed and Lorraine Warren in the Conjuring movies, the same, you know, I mean, so that's what I hope they'll learn, but that's not what they're gonna learn. They're gonna just make more Stephen King movies. Dennis. Yeah, I, I think hopefully the uh, we talked about this on Mailbag where we're saying uh, how it the success of it like I don't know we, with other genres as well people always go well now that this movie's super popular are they going to copy this or are they going to do this and it's like yeah but they like you said they always learn the wrong lessons they, they they're not looking for making the movie better or focusing on characters or focusing on this they end up going oh this this kind of more superficial thing see they, I, they pick up on i hope that's not the case because i mean i think that very similar to what we were just talking about with the rock i think because we they have a track record of doing one particular thing. It seems to always be you think of studios and going, well, what's hot today? Clowns, scary clowns. Let's have a scary clown movie. But hopefully what they realize is what the talk of this movie, what I think you might see more of, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. I think you'll see more of the kids coming of age mixed with the supernatural stuff. That's the stuff I'll start because they're going to be, what's the hot trend? Well, all these kids and the supernatural thing and let's make it. And they try to recreate whatever was hot. And I think whatever was hot wasn't just the fact that it was a scary clown movie. Hopefully they're smart enough to realize that's not what it, why it was so successful. It's so much bigger than that. The reason, because I am not a horror fan and I loved that film and I loved that film because it was a good movie it was a it, it told a great story it developed great characters it was a coming of age story mixed with horror elements because it's certainly a horror film uh, and it's certainly a coming of age story and it's there's a lot of different things that it it can it, be both it can absolutely both you don't have to say well it's it's not a horror movie because it does this yes it is you can you can classify it as a bunch of different things but what I hope doesn't happen is that just because of those things that you don't just try to recreate that. That's what studios still do. Mm. That's what they still do. They just take, they don't just take like the hot clown and make him oh let's let's take the let's crazy clown and put him in space now. It's 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 going to be a coming of age with with creepy elements because Stranger Things is is mm. hot also. You know it's it's always that's always going to happen. Yeah, and I I remember getting mailbags checking in uh, going. Wow, that it movie is totally ripping off Stranger Things. And I was just like, oh, okay. Listen, it came before and and I think we're in a nostalgic time. I think that these movies that are happening are 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 really popping because they're doing well because the, you said it Clark, it's a good movie. Christian, you said it, it's a good movie. And I hope that they that they are learning from that just like when Deadpool came out, and they're like, oh, we can do an R-rated superhero movie. Well, then we got Logan, 
and that was a fantastic movie. And it was, I don't think it was in um, answer to Deadpool. I think that they had planned uh, a gritty R-rated final chapter for Logan. So, and I'm looking back on this year of horror, and it's some of the best stuff we've seen with Get Out and Split and now It. So maybe they're learning. Maybe they're learning and we're not going to be reactionary off of it. So I'll do a little bit more of a positive spin that they're, the reason they're going to look at it working is because they gave Andy something. They gave him, just do your thing, man. Just like they gave Mangold, do your thing with Logan. Just like they gave Tim Miller, do your thing with Deadpool. Learn from that. Let the filmmakers do their thing. They have their vision for a reason. If you trust them, we, we can get special things. All right, last one. Anthony Gonzalez says, would you agree that James Gunn should helm a Star Wars film at some point? The original mm -hmm. Guardians felt like a Star Wars film almost more than an MCU film. I think he has the attention to detail like Edwards has to make a good Star Wars movie that fans would love. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends for me. Um, I didn't like <clears throat> Guardians of the Galaxy 2 really that much at all. I felt like it was a stand-up comedy show for the majority of it. I liked the first one very much. and I, It just depends on what the story and who the story is like if it's a obi-wan movie with james gunn no if it's a different character i don't know about yet and he's introducing brand new characters into the world and there's going to be a little bit of a comedic spin inside of it sure it just it just depends on what i'm a little like i i was a, i think he's a, i think he's a good filmmaker and i think he cares very much too i was just a little soured by guardians too what yeah I, i'm the same way i think I wouldn't put him in any of the episodes, you know, because yeah. th that that's a little more serious when it comes to. Uh, he could have maybe done Han Solo, young Han Solo. You I know? think we would have ran into the same problem that we ran in with well, Lord long, Miller. Well, I'm talking about like James Gunn from Guardians One, you know, versus yeah. James Gunn from Guardians. Or Jabba. So. I mean, like if yeah. they end up doing the Jabba the Hut movie, I think he could be a really good choice for that. You know, he certainly knows how to shoot uh wry action and gross stuff and yeah. and you know give him and of course i guillermo is you know i love guillermo of course but i'm just just spitballing but that being said i don't i don't really know if james would want to make a star wars right. movie be, not because he wouldn't be an ama a, a great choice but because i think james you know he's got his deal with marvel where i think feige pretty much lets him sort of no trusts him with the keys to the That's car but go, also yeah. go do donuts in the drive Driveway. You right. know what I mean? Like it's in a very contained situation. And so I, I don't think that that the Star Wars universe as it is now is would would be conducive to him. Yeah, and you're right, it's it's project by project, but I don't know why I'm connecting the previous mailbag or mailbag uh Facebook question with like, are they gonna copy the success of it and we're gonna get a bunch of scary um clown movies? It's just like we got a mailbag question of like Bill Skarsgard, now he's gonna be a great joker, right? No, not necessarily. Just because scary clown doesn't mean scary clown. Are oh, they pitching him for a Joker now? Yeah, I, I, I've seen quite a bit of mailbag questions. He's going to be the perfect Joker for the origin story. No, I like, and just because James Gunn made a Guardians of the Galaxy movie set in space doesn't mean he's perfect for Star Wars. It's like that's kind of what studios think is like. Well, yeah, I'll do this then. And that when you take James Gunn, if you look at and break down Guardians. You look at why it's special, it's because he had something to say. It was in his humor. His humor is so apparent in the first Guardians. I'm with you, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I was so let down. Um, so for him to just jump into a Star Wars movie just because he directed something that was set in space, that's you got to look at what is his strength. And and you're right, Clark. I don't think he wants to do a Star Wars movie. But I think he's, I, he's setting up. He's been saying for a long time now, he's setting up the cosmic side of the MCU. And for that, I'm happy. So he'll stick there, and I think he'll be happy. But to the question's point, I will agree that when I walked out of the first Guardians, I was like, M the thing I said was that felt like Star Wars. Oh, and it, I and I agree with you on but that. I, but I agree that it doesn't necessarily translate. Yeah, right. All right. Well, that has been this episode of Movie Talk. I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. First, the Zen master himself, Dennis Zen. Where can I find you? You guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Mark, Yodi, Riley. At Riley around Twitter and Instagram. See you there. The classiest of the classy, Clark Wolf. You can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. And Sinead DeFries, where can I find you? I'll be on TV Talk in just a few, so make sure you're watching that. And then also, I'm online at Sinead DeFries on all the social medias and at that's so Sinead.com.
And guys, if you're a fan of television, make sure you check out every day TV Talk. It's live, and so are the chipmunks in my head. I'm Christian Harloff. Make sure you follow me at Christian Harloff and watch me play Dan Merle and get smacked around. All right, guys, thanks a lot. We'll see you in a little bit. Peace! Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.